No problem. Thank you very much uh, for um, listening and tuning in. I'm going to, as I uh, mentioned, talk about personalized medicine as a practical tool to generate revenue in veterinary practices. So just going to start by just covering a little bit of what is personalized healthcare or precision medicine, and there's lots of other different names for it. But what I'm, I'm referring to is basically treating each pet as a unique individual, caring specific traits and risks relating to their breed, their genetics, their age, their sex, their weight, their location, and their lifestyle. And personalized medicine is all about designing a lifelong schedules of care or what we call life plans for a pet to, to meet their specific needs over their lifetime. Um, so that obviously is going to vary based on their breed, based on their sex, based on where they live and what they do. And it allows healthcare to really focus on prevention and early detection of disease, leading to more effective management and better clinical outcomes of patients. So um, we're no longer treating a dog as a dog, we're treating an individual based on their own individual um, traits. Um, so the big picture is in, 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 in personalized medicine is really about identifying risk that are specific to that pet, collecting relevant information from the owners. Um, and there's a big focus on information coming from the owner about their lifestyle that does affect the risk of that individual pet. And then building a screening um, that is appropriate to that risk. So if we identify that a dog is predisposed to um, heart disease and how are we going to screen that dog um, and then monitoring the trends because some of these will require lifelong sort of um, monitoring and uh, and screening and then continuously refining that process so that risk is going to obviously going to change over life and and over a sort of certain lifestyle and if we know certain things in advance, for example, we have now diagnosed hip dysplasia because we, we screen for it, then how do we manage that and how do we continue to screen for that or at least you know, have a scoring system for how we're going to manage that condition. So it's kind of a, an evolving cycle throughout the lifetime, the lifetime of the pet. And as veterinarians, we really had challenges in making that happen. So the, the idea that we treat every pet, you know, as an individual is great in theory, but there's lots of challenges to that. Um, and I'll just touch on a few points of why personalized medicine, as much as we want to implement it, has been quite difficult for veterinarians to do. So really, one of the main things is that the veterinary clinical diagnostic approach hasn't really changed in over you know 75 years. We are trained to be problem solvers. Most of the uh, appointments that we see, other than routine sort of vaccinations, is is problem is is solving problems. So we've been programmed to collect information, do a physical exam, uh, take some history from the patient, and then make a differential list, and then kind of formulate a diagnostic plan and a treatment plan for that pet, for that individual um, problem that is we're facing with right now. Uh, with personalized medicine, we're actually trying to reverse that and focusing, you know, the, uh, the attention on prevention of disease. So um, in the human world, you know, it's uh, nobody really gets excited anymore about diagnosing the diabetic as some veterinarians do. It's actually considered a failure because we've missed that pre-diabetic state where we actually had more treatment options. So focusing our, our uh, it's, it's actually, we're never going to get to a point when there's going to be no problem solving, but uh, if we're going to focus more on prevention and early detection, then we'll, we are going to, in the long term, get better outcomes for our patients. So what do we need to consider? Uh, um, so let's consider a breed, for example. We said that's one of the components that we need to consider and why it can be a bit problematic for veterinarians is if we look at um, the, the German Shepherd dog, for example, we know it's high risk of developing certain diseases like cardiomyopathy or bloat or hip dysplasia. And we also know that it, this risk is going to vary with age and weight and sex and so forth. But the German Shepherd is also prone to developing, you know, 
probably over 50 other different genetic conditions that um, we're not uh, always thinking of. And so which one of these are more important? Which ones are relevant? Which ones are more likely to happen in this patient? And how do you then um, going to confirm that? You know, we can use genetic tests for only about 30% of these diseases. So hip dysplasia, bloat, there, there is no genetic test to um, identify. And so how do the, the challenge we have is how as veterinarians we're going to process and rank and prioritize this into day-to-day -day practice. And of course it gets a lot harder in a mixed breed animal because there are a lot more diseases that uh, we need to consider if we know the breed makeup or you know what is possible in a mixed breed based on the disease mode of inheritance and how do we then go ahead and rank it you know what is relevant you know based on prevalence based on severity um, so um, um, there's um, also confusion about you know what does a, a, a breed specific DNA test mean so if we're testing von Willebrand's disease as a DNA test then um, that test has only been validated for the Doberman and maybe a few other breeds but it's not uh, been validated for uh, a mixed breed animal so there is um, a challenge in deciphering these kind of um, genetic test results for a mixed breed animal as well. And so that sheer volume of information really is becoming a bit of a, a, a hard task for um, a veterinarians to tackle. And this is only going to get worse. It's actually estimated that uh, by 2020, the medical information we'll be generating will be doubling every 73 days. So that means it's it's really going to be challenging for veterinarians to keep up with that level of uh, information and new publication and new information but there's even more challenges for veterinarians genetic testing is not routinely done in the practice uh, a lot a lot of the time um, some breeds uh, the breed identification tests have been perceived as being inaccurate by some veterinarians uh, our practice management software is not really designed to record risk accurately. Some of them are, are not even recording breed accurately. And veterinarians really don't have a lot of time to spend with clients to systematically collect, you know, pet specific information. Uh, it can, I guess, be incorporated into the wellness uh, plan for that dog. But there are opportunities. Um, so despite all of that, there are uh, a lot of advances in this space. Um, and there's a few different um, sort of interacting factors there, but we are uh, having tremendous advances in genomics and bioinformatics. You know, we have a lot more programming interfaces. Uh, there's new companies collecting, you know, pet information and now integrating it with your practice management software. We have biometric you know collars that would uh, like the likes of your you know, Fitbit or pet base or whistle that are collecting a lot of biometric information on animals there is a shift to the you know wellness and prevention sort of programs in veterinary uh, practices and it's now becoming more uh, I guess probable that we can um, start assessing individual risk using a lot of these tools um that are becoming more and more available in our industry the the shift to awareness and prevention i'm going to touch a little bit more um, just with some published data but uh, essentially everybody knows that time um, and, and all the big corporates are going towards uh wellness plans although not personalized but they they are you know they could be a dog or a, or a puppy and a senior so it's kind of getting uh, more traction in the in the veterinary world. Um, so addressing, you know, the you know how uh, pet owners can actually plan for the cost of their uh, pet care or to looking after their pet over time has been a major issue. And I think uh, some of the um, wellness plans um, out there are designed to sort of alleviate some of that for pet owners. And there's more tools becoming available to help us, you know, automate that risk assessment tools and screening schedules. 
Um, and the other good thing is that pet insurance is becoming more widely accepted and veterinarians now are starting to realise that that is uh, one of the key aspects to allowing them to practice, you know, better medicine and um, kind of getting that um, cost um, outside of their discussion when we're looking at treatment options for pets. Um, so the key steps that, uh, that we need to take when we consider implementing personalized medicine in practice is, is building an individual risk profile using uh, the information we discussed there, the, the patient's signalment, where they live, what they do, do they have pre-existing conditions, um, capturing information from pet owners, and then deciding on the screening schedules that you want to do, actually what type of screening you want to do in your practice, uh, what can you do in your practice? Um, and then communicating these benefits to pet owners. So developing some marketing materials that will uh, explain to pet owners why it is that they want to focus on prevention and early detection. It's been um, challenging um, um, as well. So we have to be quite clear in the messaging we, we provide to pet owners. So just a note on that. Questionnaires for pet owners. Uh, um, there's a couple of different options there. You can use um, um, either forms that you're doing and manually click them in, or there's some companies that offer that. Um, it's baked into um, some of um, other personalized medicine sort of solutions. But in essence, the idea is to try to capture pet owners' issues that are not necessarily being conveyed to the veterinarian at the clinic. Uh, obviously, we're all stressed for time when we have visits in the clinic, and it's really hard to cover every aspect of the pet lifestyle and that, that you know, how it impacts their healthcare. Um, you know, things like other animals in the household, you know, uh, the environment where the pet is living, you know, do you go out, you know, hunting or visiting wooded areas, you know, do you drink from streams, you know, all the diets and the, the, the supplements uh, um, that, are, that are given to clients, to, to pets. And having clients really play a more active role in identifying, you know, the the lifestyle, you know, um, of their pets is um, is a real key in getting um, adherence to recommendations. So clients really want to um, make sure that you are aware of these things, and this questionnaires really give them that platform to raise these concerns or mention things, that, and sometimes even prompt them to. Uh, start thinking about you know things that they do with their pet that may impact their um, their health. So the other thing I would say about questionnaires is they're not a one stop thing. They're basically something that you need to continuously review, and uh, we would recommend to have that questionnaire uh, circulated to clients. You know, probably twice a year, depending on the age um, of the dog. So now we have. Um, collected all that information and uh, we want to um, try to um, get or arrive at a list of what, what possible risks are there for that patient. So obviously what they do, their age, their weight, their breed, all of that would give us an idea of what diseases they might be predisposed to and then we need to start looking at how we go to prioritize that. So once you have a list of you know, 10, 20, 30 diseases depending on the breed or the breed makeup, you then Kind of want to really um, look at you know severity and prevalence, and you will have you know a gut feeling of that. But there's information in the literature that is going to help you um, get that, and then really arrive at a probably the, the five or ten most likely you know conditions for that individual, and then build a program around those specific you know um, conditions that you know are going to be clinically relevant and are going to be, you know, a risk for that dog. So if you know you have a poodle then, or a miniature poodle, you know that, you know, at some stage in its life, heart disease is going to play a factor and you want to be on the lookout for that. Um, and um, priority is a, is a key to try to focus your um, personalized sort of screening and, and plan based on those. And so once you have that list of diseases, we now want to see, okay, what are we going to do to screen? What's the best protocols? You know, what's the, what's the best way 
to screen? Uh, do we want that life plan to include all our routine care, like vaccinations and um, parasite control, um, and then creating that lifetime schedule um, to then work with your reminder system to uh, actually communicate the, the schedules to the clients? So this is an example of a combined lifetime, lifetime schedule in kind of like a table format, what happens in every stage. And you can see that there's certain things that are routine in there, but there's also um, here there is uh, some recommendations for um, um, hip radiographs at desexing and gastropexy, for example, as preventative measures that you can take for um, you know, high risk for bloat, or, um, or a high risk of um, um, dysplasia. And if we can have, if the animal is under anesthetic and we, we're doing surgery, it will be a good opportunity to take hip radiographs and uh, even consider gastropexy for that individual. Um, this is just a different example of a lifetime schedule. And you can see that um, every one of those in that particular instance is expandable. And if I look at an adult here, I can see that, you know, there is all the routine sort of elements, you know, at the bottom and on the left, but on the right, uh, they're saying consider elbow x-ray and consider um, you know, checking lumps for a mast cell tumor. So that individual was uh, high risk of developing uh, mast cell tumors and elbow issues. So at, at that time, it would be uh, appropriate to um, go and look for these lumps early on, which, you know, in a normal physical exam, we might not do, but if we we know this dog is predisposed to mast cell tumors. We'll probably pay a little bit more uh, attention and time in the annual exam to look for lumps. Uh, these are just some other examples of um, customizing the program, the, the, the schedule for that individual. Uh, we want to then discuss it with the owner. And once we agreed on the life plan, it kind of gets into autopilot and it gets in, in, you know, integrated with the reminder system. And then they just come in um, um, in the during their um, according to their schedule, whether it's annually or biannually, to um, to have their routine care, but kind of incorporating uh, the specific screens for their um, identified risks. So this is some of the um, common screening tools that can be used routinely in every clinic. And to assess risk and to um, screen and monitor for some of these diseases, we can use um, what we call genotypic tests or tests that are a once-off. You just look at the, the animal's DNA and you can see if it's predisposed to certain conditions uh, or we can use that to identify their breed if we don't know their breed. And there are phenotypic tests. So phenotypic tests are all your you know, urinalysis, fecal analysis, all your path tests, um, you know, radiographs. These are always going to change. They're not fixed, unlike the DNA. And so you would need to repeat those to try to stay on top of things, or at least give you the best chance to identify some of these risks early. Um, and then, um, um, Basically, when you start a program like that, you want to look at your database and record your baseline so you can have some idea of, you know, whether that program is having any traction in your practice. So that's a typical sort of um, annual um, um, clinic sort of baselines of some of these routine tests. And you, for most clinics, you'd be able to extract that from your uh, practice management software. Uh, there's certain things that you need to define Obviously, what's a cancer screen, what's a heart screen, that's individual for every practice. For, for a heart screen, uh, you know, it could be just a chest auscultation, or it could be a blood pressure measurement, or it could be a, an ECG or radiograph or even echo. So it kind of depends on what the practice philosophy and what the actual uh, condition is. Uh, but there's certain things that are fixed, some of them will be a bit more fluid. And once you kind of know what you're going to focus on, you can then you're going to commit to this uh, program or starting to offer personalized medicine in your practice. You want to try to set yourself some targets um, that will uh, kind of help drive that uh, program forward. And that's a typical example of what we can expect in 
you know, another month uh, to grow. And I'll show you some example of clinics that are um, implementing that in their growth. Um, and then you want to monitor progressively every month. So we're just going to look at what's what were the actual numbers, what were the targets, and then we can adjust that for the next month. So that's um, kind of um, looking at metrics that will um, help you, you know, understand the, the personalized medicine program that you're implementing and, and track it. There are a couple of key important um, uh, performance indicators that we use and uh, with practices that have started uh, implementing personalized medicine, uh, we know that um, DNA tests are a good key prognostic indicators for the health of that program as opposed to the health of their. Um, so we know that um, typically in a practice, you know, less than, you know, 1% of uh, patients will be doing DNA tests. But if you can get that up to 2 or 3% and you can see that going to be a big jump in the in the revenue that that would generate and um, practices that have been doing that for a little while have been are aiming for probably five or ten percent of pets having dna tests with uh with their life plans to uh, accommodate that and uh and we do know that on average every pet with one of these life plans will spend an additional four to five thousand dollars in in uh in screening and um you know prevention sort of measures uh, during the lifetime of their pet. Um, so we want to reassess that annually, obviously, and then kind of um, shift the focus to um, more long-term sort of planning. Um, you can see that practices, you know, are, are looking at, you know, um, experiencing more than double digit growth you know in their practices this practice did exception well almost double their um screening within their screening sort of spend of clients within probably four months so that's uh quite impressive so why do we want to do this now uh, you know it's been kind of around a bit for for a lot of time i think um one of the main reasons is it's been shown in humans that uh, if they have an identified genetic risk, they are 50 to 70 percent more likely to act upon that information. So if I go to the doctor and I smoke and I and I am overweight and my doctor tells me I need to stop smoking and start exercising, I'm you know, compliance and adherence in humans has been very poor. But um, if I have a DNA test that tells me that I am a high risk of developing heart disease, then I am 50 to 70% more likely to actually um, go, go and do something about it. And it's the same with, uh, with, with pet owners, um, with there is an identified risk, they're more likely to actually act on it. Uh, with personalized medicine, as we said, it allows pet owners to partner in the wellness planning and the prevention and it allows them to plan for the cost of their care, uh, their pet's care in the long haul. So if I'm aware that my uh, dog has got um, a predisposition to hip dysplasia, then I would uh, potentially plan for that. Or if I know my dog you know, is predisposed to diabetic, I'll be looking out for signs, early signs of diabetes or cushions or heart disease. So they are more engaged and they will be looking out for signs if they know um that that they, they are high risk for that so that leads to improved customer satisfaction we know from um uh, studies we've done in in australia that um customers are uh, a lot more happy with their pet being treated as an individual as just as a, as a dog i guess and allows veterinarians to differentiate in the marketplace we're no longer treating dogs we're treating individuals and it allows for new revenue streams to rely on that rely more on in clinic diagnostics and professional services. So we know our industry has got eroding margins on merchandising and dispensing medications and uh, and pet food. Um, there's lots of uh, competition in the open market for that now. Um, so relying on a, a professional services to build important for. Uh, or veterinary uh, practices. 
And this is um, an AHA study that uh, actually looked at um, practices that um, are experiencing double digit growth and what were the main drivers for that success. Um, so all of them were looking at, um, those practices were looking at being client centric. So we're looking at, you know, focusing on the client, focusing on what we can do, um, driving preventative care, um, leveraging technology, to embed these into practices and putting into processes that you can follow and easy to follow. Um, setting up goals and measuring your business is another key factor to driving success in the, in the practices from their preventative care um, um, and communicating the value of higher standards to clients. They're the main ones, the main key drivers. And, if you look at these closely, all of these are all the main um, pillars of personalized medicine. It's about focusing and bringing clients into the picture. It's about driving prevention, it's leveraging technology, it's setting goals and measuring them, and it's communicating uh, this value to clients. So good risk management, as we call it, or personalized medicine, you know, costs money. And um, it does um, lead to early detection, but, uh, and in the long run, it will save clients money, but um, it, it does cost them a bit more money in the front end. Um, so when a client, you know, is going to look at that and he's going to say, well, I'm actually going to spend a lot more money at the vet, you know, it's up to us to then, um, to, you know, um, describe the benefits and communicate, you know, why are we doing this and in the long term, this is really going to save you dollars. But also, um, it's, uh, it's a good opportunity to start discussing, pe discussing pet insurance, uh, um, and especially policies that covers the diagnosis and screening and treatment of hereditary diseases and chronic, you know, chronic uh, diseases. So, um, and there are um, quite a few policies uh, that will not do that, but there are a lot of policies that will do that. And I guess as veterinarians, we wanna help clients select the appropriate policies that will meet their long-term needs. So you don't necessarily need to become an expert in insurance, but you just need to be able to pick a plan that's going to um, cover the needs and cover the, the um, you know, diagnostic treatment of um, hereditary conditions. And obviously there's a lot of those um, out there. So putting this all together, um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's really important to have, you know, the whole, excuse me, the whole team buy into that, understanding the concept, you know, the benefits, the challenges, why are we gonna do this in the practice, creating a timeline of what you need to do first you know, and who will do it and by then, by when, and determining your baselines and forecasts and targets, completing your clients' messages and, um, and then sort of um, going through that again with the team to create some sort of a training program and internal testing. You can do that for the, the, the staff members' own pets. Uh, um, and then, once you start, you want to um, continuously review, measure, and and uh, and change um, that cycle as we described in the beginning. So this personalized medicine concept is really not for every pet. So if you have a farmer who's been growing, you know, uh, raising puppies, you know, or dogs on a farm forever, they're probably not going to be your ideal um, um, client to present this to. So while all pet owners would want to engage in that in that concept, um, there is um, you know the universally for for that to be adopted is going to take time. So it's it's natural to start with you know first time pet owners, uh, owners of newly acquired pets or puppies, um, who'd be generally more receptive to the messaging and and they'll generally at that point where they want to um, learn more and um, do the best that they can to look after their pet. Certain market segments are often referred to as pet parents, you know, they're also most likely to be early adopters of this technology and take on board this, um, this uh, personalized medicine approach and life planning approach. Um, 
and that uh, tends to be the same people that you know are looking for that same sort of um, level of medicine for their own health through you know with their own physicians. Um, and once you have these on board, and slowly you can you know expand that to the remaining of the clients in your practice. Uh, generally, thing we we find that um, it's probably the top twenty to thirty percent, depending on your practice location and demographics. That will that will take up something like that. So it's just setting up the expectations that uh, this is only going to be taken up by you know probably the top twenty percent of your clients, rather than you know expecting everyone to take that and then um, I guess being disappointed. So setting realistic expectations for this kind of uh, program in the practice is uh, is important. I think timing is also quite important. You're not going to offer that to a pet parent, even if it's a new pet owner, if the pet has just been hit by a car or um, is, is coming in after some sort of trauma. You know, to uh, obviously do that when you're talking routine care. And I just want to finish by some um, quotes from Dr. Laura Lackerman. You know, he's uh, the author of the Five Minute Veterinary Consult and. Um, uh, also of the genetic connection and he basically saying personalized medicine relies on a hospital team to counsel pet owners uh, with a focus on prevention and, and, and early detection rather than treatment. Uh, teams will use genetic and non-genetic tests as well as input from pet owners to appreciate risk factors in an individual animal and then make recommendations accordingly. The combination of the team's effort is the life plan or that schedule that we talked about uh, of recommended interventions over the pet's lifetime. Um, it is um, hospital teams working closely with pet owners that will successfully drive personalized medicine and its benefits in the practice. So uh, I couldn't agree more with these, uh, with these quotes. It is a team effort um, and you need to have everyone in the practice sort of kind of sing the same song um, to make that work. So I've listed here um, some useful resources that would help, um, will help you look at um, assessing risks, um, looking at breed specific sort of um, information. Um, there is, um, there's a lot of information uh, that is serious that will help you um, look at what's out there, the publications. Um, you can also, um, use um, some fun quizzes to spark interest in the, in the practice and I've listed a couple of uh, uh, cute sort of um, links that you can follow. Um, and um, there's some commercial partners there that um, you can look at that um, offering 10 key solutions to, uh, to implement these kind of um, um, personalized medicine solutions in your practice.